Luke chapter 10. We want to share a portion of the Word of God with you tonight. And uh, I trust it will be a blessing and be a help to us. I want to bow for a moment of prayer, and then we're going to begin reading down in about verse number 25. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege we have to assemble together one more time this side of eternity and to worship you in spirit and in truth. I thank you for the wonderful service this morning from our young people and for the good service tonight and the sweet spirit that is here. And Lord, I thank you that one day that you did place the highest call upon our life. And I'm grateful for that tonight. And I pray that you'll help us as the Apostle Paul exhorted us to always walk worthy of the vocation wherein you've called us. And I pray tonight that as we look into your word that you'll quicken your word to our hearts. And may it not just be a sermon, but Lord, may it be a message to the hearts of the people that are here tonight in this place. Give us the freedom and the liberty as we preach that will most honor and glorify yourself. And we'll be careful to give you praise for it because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter number 10, and we're going to begin reading down in verse number 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. We're going to stop reading there in verse number 37. And of course, here in the passage of Scripture that we're referring to tonight is a very familiar portion of Scripture. We're going to center up most of our thoughts tonight around verses from verse 30 down through verse 35 and share some thought with you tonight about this parable of the Good Samaritan. Here the lawyer had come to Jesus and I think really had an underhanded motive in mind when he asked the question, uh, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, I think he was asking Jesus in a way, in fact the Bible says in verse 25, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. I think that tells us somewhat of the motive and the objective this lawyer had and uh, when he asked the question. And of course, Jesus didn't really give him the answer that he was looking for or, or possibly wanted to hear. And, uh, but, uh, and, and the man was guilty because in verse, 30, verse 29, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? He didn't want to dwell long on that part about loving God, did he? about loving God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And uh, so he diverted the subject right quickly to uh, who is my neighbor? And of course, Jesus didn't really answer that the way he thought he was going to answer because he said, who is my neighbor? And when Jesus got down to verse 36, he said, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him? He was talking about being a neighbor rather than finding a neighbor or who is my neighbor uh, in loving my neighbor as myself. But anyway, I want to center our thoughts tonight 
as I said, from verses 30 down through verse 35 and share just a simple message with you tonight about this Good Samaritan. Now, I believe there's only one interpretation of Scripture. There are many applications of Scripture. I've preached three or four different messages from these verses of Scripture concerning the, the Good Samaritan. I preached a message one night on thieves and robbers. Title of the message, Thieves and Robbers, from this passage of Scripture. But I want to preach tonight, and I want us to look at this Samaritan as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to see him in that light tonight as uh, we look at this story. Because in many of the characteristics that we see about this good Samaritan, we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. But first of all, I want us to go back to verse 30. And I want us to look, first of all, at a picture of man's departure from God. Man's departure from God. Verse number 30, Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And we know from the scripture that, that Jerusalem is the foundation of peace. Jericho is the place of a curse. And here's the picture of man's departure from God. He went down, the Bible says, from Jerusalem to Jericho. And any time any person is walking away from God, he is always going down. There's no alternative. When a man walks from God, he's going downhill. And so the Bible said that a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now, here in the Scripture, the Bible said that they stripped him. That's kind of unusual, isn't it? They stripped him of his raiment and then wounded him. Most of the time, a thief will wound you, then strip you of your raiment or take what he chooses to take after he wounds you. But the Bible says that he fell he fell among thieves. Well, that reminds me of Adam. Back over in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they fell to the thief of all thieves. They fell to the author and the origin of all stealing and thievery. So here in the Bible says that this man went down from Jerusalem, fell among thieves. You notice that the Bible said that they stripped him of his raiment. Now here's a picture in verse number 30, uh, really of every one of us when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because all of us are fallen creatures in the sight of God. All of us are fallen uh, from the state that God created man in and we've inherited that fallen state from Adam. But the Bible said that they stripped him of his raiment I believe that raiment could speak of righteousness or uh, any self-righteousness that this man might have. He, he lost his raiment. I believe this man lost his resources. I believe when the Good Samaritan found him, this man was stripped of his raiment. I believe he had been stripped of his resources. I believe they took his money. And then he was, he was left, the Bible said, half dead. They wounded him, leaving him half dead. He was left without recourse. In other words, what could he do? He was left helpless. He had no uh, place to turn, no place to go. He was left wounded and half dead. Do you know tonight that's the condition that the Lord comes to us in and a man will never get saved? He'll never get saved. There is no way that this man, if you go back to the, to the context and realize that it says a Samaritan, that it says a Samaritan. Now, Jews had nothing whatsoever to do with Samaritans. In fact, a Samaritan was repulsive to them. They considered Samaritans as no more than dogs. They had no dealings whatsoever with Samaritans. And this man had to be totally helpless, stripped of his raiment, stripped of his resources, 
and without any recourse whatsoever. In other words, he had no choice. He was at the end of himself, laying there half dead. That's the only way that he would have received anything from this Samaritan that came by. Well, before we're too quick to jump now to the, to the defense of this situation, you and I didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus till we ended up there either. Amen. I mean, if we would testify to the honest truth tonight that it is only after a man comes to the very end of himself and the devil has stripped him of any self-righteousness that he may be clothed with, he is stripped of any resources that he holds uh, within himself, he has no recourse, no place to turn, no place to go, and only then will a man accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners under repentance. And I believe one of the things today that is just as difficult as getting folks saved is getting folks lost. If you can get a man lost, you, your chances of getting him saved are pretty good, amen? But uh, here was a man who had been stripped, he had fallen among thieves, and we know the devil is the thief of all thieves, and he is the one who stripped us of any righteousness that we would have had in Adam, and uh, he stripped us of all of our resources, and without any recourse whatsoever, left us bankrupt before God. But I want to tell you that this man, it turned out to be the greatest blessing that had ever happened to him. Because if this man had not fallen among thieves and fallen on the circumstances that he was in, no doubt he would have continued his journey to the place of the curse. He would have continued his journey. He would have continued his journey to Jericho. And I'm standing here tonight without a doubt in my mind, and I'm pointing this finger back this way when I say this, but do you know tonight had not we, some of us, fallen on ill circumstances at that time that we met the Lord Jesus Christ and come to the end of ourself, the end of our self-righteousness and resources and we're left without any recourse, that many of us had already be in the cursed place tonight. We'd already be in hell without any hope had not we too fallen among the thief of all thieves and the devil who wrecked our life. I could stop right here tonight and ask people to give testimony. Of how many people in this place tonight were like this man when Jesus found you, and maybe one after another, they would stand up. I've had people tell me, well, I don't put a whole lot of confidence in these professions of faith and these people who get saved when the bottom falls out and, and they're going through terrible circumstances in their life. Well, friend, I want to tell you, that's the way most folks get saved. The Bible, Jesus said, they that are whole need not a physician. I'm not in the habit of calling a physician, but I want to tell you, when I'm made aware that I have a need, then I'll call the physician. You see, you don't ever accept Jesus till you get to the end of yourself. Well, here was a picture of man's departure from God. He fell among thieves, walking away from God, going to, toward the place of Jericho. And he was stripped of his raiment, his resources, and he was left without any recourse. He was hopeless and helpless in the condition that he was in. Now, we're not only seeing this story tonight, man's departure from God, but look in verse number 31 and verse number 32, and we're going to see the deception of religion. We will see the deception of religion. Verse number 31, the Bible said... And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Here is the deception of religion. It says a certain priest, and the Bible said, and by chance there came down. What does that mean, preacher? That means he was traveling the same way that this man was. He was going the same direction. The Bible said he came down. You know which way religion's going tonight? Down. It is going down. And it may have a, it may have a veneer on front of it. And, it. and it may look impressive from the outside, but I want to tell you that, that religion tonight is clouds without any water. Religion tonight is hopeless. They offer nothing whatsoever to a lost and a dying world. 
The Bible said there came down a certain priest that way and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Isn't that strange? You may tell you why that he passed by on the other side because religion is always looking for people to serve it. They're never looking for victims or people to serve, but religion is always looking for those that can serve their purposes and do for them. But you see, Christianity is like Christ. He said, I came not to be ministered unto, but I came to minister. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. But religion tonight, religion tonight, the deception of religion is that it offers nothing. It offers nothing. This priest when he looked on that man and saw that man laying there, he did not know but what this man was dead and he was not about to defile himself with that dead body. You see, he knew that was against his law, the, very, the law of his religion, and he wasn't about to defile himself. Now, I want to tell you tonight, religion don't want to fool with the downer and outers. Religion don't want to talk about that man in the gutter of his sin. Religion does not want to have anything to do with that woman that has sold herself into the hands of wicked, lustful men and prostituted herself. Religion don't want to have anything to do with those folks. Religion is not the hope of the drug addict tonight. Religion is not the hope of the harlot and the prostitute. Religion is not the hope of the drunkard tonight. Religion is not the hope of the sinner. Religion's traveling the same way. And religion is not going to dirty its hands or take a chance on defiling its pretty image. Oh, religion has the image. It has the image. It's like Steve was preaching this morning that uh, that man at the beautiful gate, how many people just walked on by and didn't do anything for him, didn't offer him anything, just, just walked on by. Well, we hear a lot, and I don't want to get off into, into that. Steve mentioned it this morning, preaching. But religion passes around a lot of money. But if money won't cure it, they're helpless. But we're like Peter and John. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I want to tell you, we possess the answers. We possess the solution to man's problem, and that is Jesus Christ. We possess Jesus. Religion cannot offer that. And then the Bible said, and likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, I tend to type this... Levite in verse 32 as the law. You see, religion wouldn't do it. He didn't make any hesitation at all. By chance there came down a certain priest that way. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But the law got a little closer. But the law couldn't do anything for him either. The Bible said in verse 32, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. He did take time to walk over there and look at the man. But then the Bible said he passed by on the other side. <clears throat> now the priest wouldn't do it, and the law couldn't do it. The Bible says, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. The law only condemns us. The law offers no help and no hope to a sinless world or to a sinful world. And so here we see in verses 31 and verse 32 the deception of religion. They pass by on the other side. Now here's the tragedy. Here's the tragedy. When you place emphasis on the other side, much of the Christian world has taken the attitude of religion and the law, and we too are passing by on the other side. We have the answers. We have what they need, 
but we too are passing by on the other side. And may I say to you, that is a worse crime than religion and the law. It's for you and I to have the answer to the wounded and wavered of this world and for you and I to pass by on the other side is a greater crime than what religion is doing and it is a greater crime than the helplessness of the law to, to help a man and reach out to a man is for you and I to have the resources that man needs and for you and I to cross and walk over to the other side and go on by. That's a greater tragedy and a greater crime. You say, preacher, why? do the majority of people walk by on the other side? Why out of all the people who went into the temple at the hour of prayer, why were the only two, Peter and John, that took the time to stop and meet the need of that man sitting at the beautiful gate? I'll tell you why, the same reason most people walk on the other side is because the other side is a place of no involvement. There's no involvement on the other side. Now, preacher, I'll come to church and I'll put my money in, but don't expect me to teach a Sunday school class. Don't expect me to get involved in the church uh, program or anything. I want to just come and listen, hear the singing and the preaching, but I don't want to get involved. Don't try to involve me. I want to just sit on the sidelines and just be a spectator. But may I say to you, this old world is in need of some participators tonight rather than just spectators. But many people go on by on the other side because it's a place of no involvement. It's a place where there's no interest, no real interest in the needs of others. The other side, there's no real interest and concern about those that are wounded and those that are wayward. It don't get right in here in the pit of your stomach. You pass by on the other side and you don't have to see that. Now, I don't know about you, but it bothers me when I see some of the conditions that's in this world. Does it bother you? I mean, to see some of the hurting people and the wounded people and see the, the remains of the ruined lives of people the devil has made havoc out of their lives, I want to tell you that it bothers me to see people in such a state, to know the devil is wrecking and ruining their lives. There's no interest and concern for the wounded and wavered on the other side of the road. On the other side of the road, there's no inconveniences. Now, I could preach a long time tonight, but I'm trying to get to the message <clears throat> on, on this, how full we are to convenience. On the other side of the road, there's no inconveniences. I'm going to tell you, when you walk with God, there'll be some times you'll be inconvenienced. But everybody's looking for a convenient religion. We've geared everything to our convenience. We start to, somebody mentioned to me here a while back, not long ago, we discussed it one time, and we did like, much of the things in Baptist churches do, we kind of tabled it. <laughs> but somebody asked me here a while back, said, Preacher, why don't we start at 6 o'clock on Sunday instead of 7? It would be much more convenient. And I said, well, for about as many people as, as it would be convenient to start at 6, it would be inconvenient for about that many more. And so 7 is not really convenient for some, it is more convenient for others. And, but, but, and I'm not throwing off on that. I, it, it, make it, it doesn't make a bit of difference to me. And we started at 5 o'clock on Sunday. You know, I, so, so I'm not politicking for 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or whatever. So I'm just using this as an illustration to say that we have done everything in our power to make everything just 
convenient. Convenient. We have church on Sunday night. If people, if it's convenient, they'll come back on Sunday night. If it's convenient on Wednesday night, they'll come on Wednesday night. You have revival. If it's convenient, they'll come. But don't expect me to go out of my way. Now, the only thing wrong with that is you're traveling on the wrong side of the road. The other side of the road is a place of no inconveniences. But Jesus, that, that it would be convenient for you to be my disciple. But he said, if any man be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. Jesus said right the opposite. You'll be inconvenienced. In fact, to deny yourself and take up the cross, that cross is a symbol of death. When you walk with God and you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus, there's a lot of things you have to die to. In fact, I think you can just kind of sum it up in a nutshell. You have to die to self. Not my will, but thine be done. But on the other side is a place of no interest in the needs of others. It's a place of no involvement. On the other side of the road is a place of no inconveniences. But the man is left in his condition. They didn't inconvenience themselves. They didn't show a lot of interest in him. They didn't get involved in his situation. But the man was left in his condition. And while we are not willing to inconvenience ourselves and get interested in the wounded and wayward, and while we're not willing to get involved in the work of God, the wounded and wayward of this world grow in number every single day. So we see the deception of religion. Religion has no hope for them. Religion offers them nothing. Religion wouldn't do it. The law couldn't do it. And that brings me to my third point tonight, and that is the deliverance <clears throat> through the Good Samaritan. The deliverance through the Good Samaritan. Look in verse number 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, why is the wording different in verse 33? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, didn't say he was going down, but it said as he journeyed. That tells me that this Samaritan was going somewhere. He was deliberately and with purpose traveling as he journeyed. Are we going anywhere on purpose tonight? Or are we like the priest by chance? By chance. I want to tell you, there's not much going to happen by chance. The devil will see to that. I want to tell you something tonight. People are saved. People are brought to Jesus. People have their wounds bound up. They find their needs met. When people get deliberate about this journey that we're on, and when we walk with purpose in our lives to do something about those that are lost and undone without God in this world, great churches are not built by chance. This place didn't just happen, but this place come about right here because of some people that had purpose and direction. They were going somewhere. Do we have that per the Bible said but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. He came with purpose. And look what the Bible said. A certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was. Well, the Bible didn't say that he was traveling the same way as the priest and the Levite. The Bible said as he journeyed. I do believe probably, especially for the picture that I'm trying to put in this, for the Good Samaritan, the picture of the Lord Jesus, he was traveling the same way, but it wasn't by chance. But one day, the God of glory purposed to become incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ and to leave all of heaven's glory 
and deliberately and with purpose come down in this world where we're at. Do you know tonight that the God of glory in the person of Jesus Christ took upon himself the form of man and was, or the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and with purpose came down into this world where you and I are at? I didn't know tonight that the other group was going to sing. Brother David's group that sang a moment ago and the song was a blessing. I didn't know they were going to sing, but I was about to ask Brother Thomas to sing that song before I preached tonight. He came to me. He came to me. That's one of my favorite songs because that's exactly what Jesus did. When we could not get to him, when we, like this man, were laying the side of the road, stripped of our raiment, had no righteousness of our own, we were robbed of our resources, had no recourse in this world, I want to tell you the God of glory loved us enough that with purpose and direction that he came down into this world to where you and I were at and was willing to go all the way to the place of the curse. How far did Jesus go? He went all the way to that place of being separated from God. That place of being separated from God, that's where he had to come in order to get where you and I were at. Oh, I remember as a kid preacher when I first started out preaching and studying the Bible and, and studying, and I remember when I was a young preacher, I always wanted to preach on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. I read Arthur Pink's book on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And I read Lehman Strauss's book on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And I wanted to preach on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. But I was hung up on one of them sayings. And I couldn't get it in my heart. And I couldn't understand it. And so I, it just messed the whole message up because I couldn't preach it. And that was that one where Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I tried different explanations, and I'd read other people's thoughts, and you know, in their books and so forth, and I just never could get comfortable, you know. And 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 I tried to 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 take the position that well, that God was holy and righteous, and He couldn't stand or bear to look upon sin, and so He looked away from Jesus. But somehow there's just something still missing. There's something still missing. I, I just felt like that, 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 that there was something more to that statement. And one day, the Holy Ghost turned a light on. And I want to tell you, I had a shouting spell. I got beside myself. And I didn't, I mean, I, it wasn't a rapture, but I thought it was going to get rapture. I got carried away before I got carried away. When I realized that Jesus Christ had to be totally separated from God because that's where I was at and the only way that I could get back to God was for Jesus to come where I was at and get me and bring me back to him. And that's where he had to go to get me. That's where he had to go to get you too. You were separated from God and he had to come all the way where you were at. A certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was. I want to tell you, the Lord of glory came where we were at. And he had to go all the way to that place of being separated from God and to cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's why he had to be forsaken because that's where you and I were at. We were separated from God. No way back across that gulf. No way back. The gulf was too great. And we couldn't get back, but he came where I was. Hallelujah. Came where I was when I couldn't get to him. So the Bible said, certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. You see, that line of thought goes right on. That word compassion is more than to just show pity or, or sympathy or to show love. That word compassion means to put yourself in their place. And this certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. What does that mean, preacher? That means he saw himself laying there. He saw himself in the place of that man laying there. That's what it means to have compassion. That's a strong word, is that word compassion. 
It goes a step beyond just, just love. Compassion is to put yourself in that place. That means when you ride down the streets of Atlanta, you see an old wino or a drunk laying over there on the sidewalk wallowing around in his own vomit. To have compassion on him means to see yourself laying there were it not for the grace of God. It means to see yourself there. It means to get out and put yourself in his place. And that's what this good Samaritan did. The Bible said he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him. He went to him. That means personal. He didn't just come in the vicinity. He didn't just stop in the vicinity of this man, but he got personal. He went to him. Can you remember when Jesus did more than just come to your vicinity? When he came in this world, he came to our vicinity. But can you remember that day or night when he came to you personally? The Bible said he went to him. He came to him personally. Personally. I'll never forget. Little boy, 11 years old, under conviction, in a revival meeting, afraid to go to sleep at night, afraid I wouldn't wake up the next day. And I remember old brother Ed Blue, I remember just like his yesterday, he walked over to me and he said, Junior, he said, and I was standing there already crying anyway, and he said, would you like to get saved? I said, I sure would. I said, I sure would. Jesus got personal with me that night. He personally came where I was, 11-year-old boy. You may be here tonight, a 10 or 11-year-old child. Jesus can come to you. He can get personal with you. You may be here tonight, a teenager. You may be a middle-aged person. Or you may be an elderly person, but if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, he, he can come to you. He sees you. The Bible said he saw him, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he went to him. Now, let me hurry on. He said that he went to him, and he, in verse 34, when he had compassion on him, he went to him, and he bound up his wounds. Aren't you thankful that he was willing to do what the priest wouldn't do and what the law couldn't do? Jesus did. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Oil in the Scripture, as you know, is a type of the Holy Spirit. Wine in the scripture speaks of joy. And you know what Jesus does? He pours in the Holy Spirit when you get saved and gives you joy that this world could never give you. He gives you joy and a happiness that you'll never find if you search the world over. He gives you a power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast. And I'm going to skip over that and get to the next part. And he brought him to an end. And took care of him. And you know what that inn was? That inn was a place of comfort. That inn was also a place of company. It was a place where other people were. You know what the church is tonight? It's a place of comfort. And it's a place of company and fellowship. And you know what Jesus does when he comes to those individuals and gets personal with them and saves them? He brings them in to the church. He brings them into the church. And I'm going to go a step farther than that. People say, well, that's thought you, that when, when Jesus brings them, he brings them into the invisible church. Well, I never have seen the invisible church. I know a lot of Baptists that belong to it. <laughs> because most of the time they're invisible. <laughs> Amen. But you're looking at one preacher that believes in the ministry of the local church. Amen. And I believe when, when God saves a man that he purposes for that individual to be brought into a local assembly where there's comfort and company and fellowship of other believers. Now I'm going to tell you, you call it weakness if you want to, but I can't do that in my church. Say, well, these people, you know, they, they don't have to go to church. They people that just go to church, they just use that as a crutch. Well, it helps me get by. Helps me get by. I tell you what, you can call it a crutch if you want to. I've got enough sense to know I've been around long enough to know I can't get by without it. I'll tell you something else. I need you a whole lot worse than you need me. I need the church a whole lot more than the church needs me. 
Oh, you say, but preacher, you're the pastor. That doesn't make any difference. I need the church. I need the church. And I believe every born-again believer ought to be associated with a church, a place of comfort and company. And that's exactly where the Good Samaritan brought him. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. And he instructed on verse 35, and on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Now, whatever type or picture or symbol that you've read into that verse, I want to just, I want to just put my version on it, okay? I want to make my application on it. I believe that when Jesus saves people and they come into the church, that God expects you and I to take care of those people. We're not going to go unrewarded. We're not going to go unrewarded. The Good Samaritan said he brought him into the inn and told the host of that inn, he said, I want you to take care of him. And if he costs you anything, I want you to know I'll settle up with you when I come. I want you to know it's not going to cost you anything. I'll take care of it. Do you know tonight that if a church takes care of its own, you can't go wrong with that because the Lord said, I, don't worry, I'll take care of you. And if the books were to get out of balance, don't worry, I'll balance them. I'll balance them for you. I'll take care of you. I'll reward you for what you do. And folks, we got a responsibility. My, what a responsibility that we have as the church, the place of comfort and the place of company, the place of fellowship for those that get saved and come into this place to minister to their needs. And to min now listen, I'm not talking about just dollars and cents. If we, listen, if we drain the church treasure dry tonight, there's some people in this place that have needs that it wouldn't do a thing for them. If you gave them everything, every dime we got in the church tree, it wouldn't do a thing for their need. So don't think I'm just talking about dollars and cents. In fact, we do wrong. I'm going to tell you, money don't solve everything. Money don't solve everything. But we have opportunity, and not only opportunity, but we have responsibility that's been given by us of the Lord Jesus Christ to meet the needs spiritual needs, material needs, fit, whatever the needs are, to take care of the, those that belong to the Lord. And he said, I want you to take care of him. And folks, I want to tell you something. You'll never find the friendship and the fellowship in the world that you'll ever find in the church. Now, I want to tell you, this is my crowd I had rather have the church praying for me than anything that I know. If I had a material need tonight, and I don't, I don't, so don't jump to conclusion. I don't. This church takes better care of me than any place I've ever been. I don't have to want for anything. I love you, and I appreciate you for what you do for me. But if I had a physical need or a material need, I'd rather be associated with God's people than a millionaire in the outside world. How many offerings they take up on the job for you when you have a physical or a material need? How many times the dinner where, where you work have they ever took up an offering for you, helped you through your financial crises? Oh, you say, I know one that did, yeah, and it was probably a Christian who suggested it. Amen? Stay with me now. Yeah, huh? You don't find this kind of friendship in the world. I don't care how close you think they are. You get, talk, you get talking to somebody about their pocketbook, you'll find out where your friendship's at. You find, find out where it ends. Like one fellow told me, running a place of business, he said, I just come to the conclusion, I'm in business to make money. If it's, got, if it's going to cost me to know you, I'd just soon not know you. And that's the attitude of the world. Amen. And I want to tell you, this end I'm talking about tonight, that's the church that is a place where a company of people in a place where comfort is offered is a place where people bear one another's burdens and you'll never find any. I told somebody the other day, I said, you'll never find the friendship and the comfort in this world that you'll find among God's people. 
You'll never, you never will. He brought him to the right place. And I want to tell you, when people get saved, the church is the place they need to be. If I had time, I'd just show you what God's intentions are. God intends for a man, I believe, to find a local assembly and unite with a local assembly and be a part of a church and the family of God when he gets saved. And if we're not going to go wrong ministering to the needs of people, whether they be spiritual, whether they be physical, or whether they be material. We're not going to, you're not going to go wrong because that's why we're here is to minister to the needs of others. Sometimes, Brother Tom, you come get a song. I'm trying to find a place to quit. Uh, sometimes a person has an emotional need that just a word, a comforting word from a brother or sister is what they need to hear. Sometimes a person might have a material need and God impressed it upon the heart of someone to meet that material need. I've stood right here in this place over the past six years. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of money. But I'm not stingy. And I've stood in this place right here and had God to impress my heart to help somebody with a material need and so help me, I've had God give it back to me before I get out the door. I have. I'm honest with you. I've had people, I've had people do, I never will forget one Sunday. A preacher come in this place, I knew he was between churches and I knew he was having a tough time and I didn't have a lot of money but I had a $20 bill that I felt led to give him. I gave him a $20 bill about right there on that third pew, right uh, about where my wife's sitting there, right there where Sister Irene's sitting at. I gave him a $20 bill at that right there. And by the time I got to the back door back there, old Brother Pierce Smith handed me a $20 bill and said, God told me to give you this, preacher. Boy, I got out. I can stand here tonight and relate to you. I remember one time, and I won't go back into the details of this, I remember one time I gave away 100 and got six in its place before I got out. I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. Man, give me an envelope. I got home and counted out $600 in $50 bills. I figured you know what to do with this. I already, already had it spent before he gave it to me. But that's what, it, that's what it's all about. Now, I'm not talking about taking my tithe money. I put my tithe in the church. But for a long time, I've had others' money. that God just impresses me sometimes to give. If I had money like that preacher, I'd give it away too. I don't have that kind of money. I just got a little bit that I swap around once in a while. I put it, take it out of this pocket and give it over here and God puts it back in this pocket. But God uses me to comfort or to help somebody along the way. We have emotional needs. Somebody needs a word of comfort. Many times they have material needs and, and God may impress it on your heart to give somebody a 20 or, or a 10 or a 50 or, or a 100 or whatever. Now don't do it thinking you're going to get six back in your place. You might lose your 100. You better do it for the right reason and know God's impressing it upon your heart. I'm just saying when the body of Christ is functioning the way that it ought to, that a person can get saved and come into this church and God will always have somebody ministering to whatever their need is because that's the way he intends for the body to function, that we bear one another's burdens, whether they be spiritual, emotional, whether they be physical or financial, whatever it is, you'll never find a greater friendship than you'll find among God's people. Whatever heads bowed, never eye closed. Father, take the message tonight. Use it to your own honor and to your own glory. Lord, help us to be like the Good Samaritan. Help us, Lord, to be willing to be inconvenienced. Help us, Lord, not to walk on the other side of the road, but, Lord, help us to stop and show compassion and help us to reach down and, and, to, and to bind up the wounded and to pour in the oil and the wine and, and Lord, to bring them in to the warmth and the comfort and the company of the church and to minister to their needs. Lord, that... Good Samaritan, of all good Samaritans, the Lord Jesus has given us a per perfect example to go by. Help us to be like Jesus.
Help us to be like him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. We're going to